Welcome to Healthy vs. Toxic, the podcast where licensed mental health professionals explore what makes a relationship healthy or unhealthy or even abusive, all from a scientifically informed perspective. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, does body language reveal deception or does it really reveal anything? So does body language tell us anything about what people are thinking, what their secrets are, or any other information? We've seen a few videos recently and a few blogs about these different individuals who claim that they can read the body language from like interviews they see on television or on YouTube, and they can tell that people are lying or they can tell that they're up to no good or what they're thinking. Is this really possible? Does body language really tell us enough? to make these types of determinations. Now, this is an interesting set of questions, right? This gets into this idea that people can read posture, facial expressions, and other body movements. And their theory is really based on this idea that the individual can decide to conceal the truth or conceal their feelings, but the body's gonna communicate this information either way. And in theory, these experts have the decoder chip, I guess, right? They have the ability to know what the code is and to know how to read the code and decipher all this meaning from body language. This used to be mostly about detecting lies, but now it's expanded into thoughts, feelings, innermost desires, and hidden meanings. So this whole kind of industry around detecting body language has really expanded a lot. Now, much of it's based, initially at least, much of it was based on this one particular paper. I've talked about this in a prior video that was misinterpreted as saying that 93% of communication is nonverbal and 7% is verbal. That's really not what the paper said at all. It was really talking about the idea of liking something and what type of behaviors go into communicating this idea of liking something. It was never about nonverbal behavior being 93% of communication. So the foundation here, if that was the foundation. I think for many, it was. The foundation is really crumbling. That was an article by a researcher named Arabian, and it came out a while ago, and it's been cited numerous times by these body language experts. So at first, I guess this seems kind of innocent, right? So there's some people out there, some so-called body language experts that believe that they can detect lies and figure out people's secrets and things like that. So this doesn't really seem to hurt anybody. Well, that's actually not the case. Some of this so-called evidence of this ability has been used to put in place different programs to detect lies that aren't based on any scientific evidence. For example, we see that there are behavior detection officers in the Transportation Safety Administration, the TSA, that ostensibly can detect lies or detect suspicious behavior and prevent people that are dangerous from getting onto an airplane. Again, there's no scientific evidence to support this. So people are acting on this information without really making sure it's valid. And of course, this can end up causing harm, not the least of which is wasting money, but also believing that you're safe, believing that you can detect people when in fact you may not be able to. The results of the studies that led to that program can actually be explained just as well by chance. So we know with that program, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Now, we've seen other examples, though, of how body language can be used to detect lies, right? We see this idea that if somebody closes their eyes, that can be indicating deception. If they scratch their neck, touch their nose, cover their mouth, start talking in a high-pitched voice, or pull on their ear. Again, all these, at some level, have been connected to deception through what people call research. But again, none of this is actually true. None of those things, none of those behaviors actually indicate deception. So again, it can give somebody kind of a false sense of confidence. They believe they can detect deception, but they really can't. So what about the myths with eye contact? I've heard about these a lot. Liars don't make eye contact. When somebody is telling a lie, they find it difficult to make eye contact. So you can use that. You can use that to detect deception. Or pathological liars may know this and overcompensate to prove that they're not lying and make excessive eye contact. So really, you have a few different versions of this theory. Liars don't make eye contact or they make excessive eye contact. As it turns out, neither one of these are true. Now, we do see that 
there's some useful information that you can get from eye contact. We know that if you maintain eye contact for more than a few seconds, that can make people uncomfortable. That leads to nervousness. And we also know that flirtatious behavior has an association with eye contact lasting more than a few seconds. So somebody may think that you're flirting with them if you hold eye contact too long. Now, it's an early step in the flirting process, but that has been shown by research to be true. Nothing to do with lying, of course, but eye contact still has some meaning. Now, a lot of these so-called body language experts are also experts, supposed experts, in neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP. And I've talked about this in a prior video as well. We know that NLP isn't based on any legitimate science. It hasn't been empirically validated. One of the theories from NLP is that if somebody looks up and to the right from their perspective, that they're lying. And this has been tested repeatedly, and we know this simply isn't true. So again, eye contact does tell us something, but it doesn't tell us anything about deception. Now, there are a number of other myths about body language as well, but not all of them involve deception detection, right? So if we look at this idea around placing your hand on somebody's shoulder, this is sometimes thought to be linked to showing dominance. So if somebody puts their hand on your shoulder, they're trying to dominate you. And in fact, we know from scientific studies, that's not true. Now, it is interesting to note here that women tend to initiate touch, not necessarily the hand on the shoulder, but just touch in general, more frequently than men. So there are some differences there. And a lot of times when we think of this type of touching, we're thinking of somebody reaching out and like touching your arm to get your attention or just to say hi. Now, one thing I've noticed throughout my career is that when people introduce you to somebody else, especially if they're kind of close to you, they'll sometimes put their hand on your shoulder. It's like a sign of affection or a sign of familiarity. And I've never been super comfortable with this. I don't mind if somebody puts their hand on my shoulder just for a second, or if they touch my arm or whatever, that's all okay. But when somebody puts their hand on your shoulder and they're kind of like rubbing your shoulder, like they keep their hand there for more than like two or three seconds, for me, that gets a bit awkward. I remember this one time I was being introduced to a new colleague by a current colleague, and she had her hand on my shoulder, my current colleague did, and she kind of kept it there for, I think it was probably like four or five seconds, which may not seem like a big deal, but it was a little long for my taste. And I kind of looked over my shoulder at her and I said, I don't think I know you well enough for this. And she immediately kind of pulled her hand back and was a little bit embarrassed and we kind of laughed it off. But I think what happened there, because she told me later, is she just forgot. Like she was distracted. She was excited. She was talking to a lot of different people, introducing people, saying a lot of things. And she put her hand on my shoulder and just left it there. And it was one of those things like, I don't know, it just made me a little uncomfortable. I don't know what the reason is, but it's just something interesting. So these kind of actions have some meaning. Like I didn't think she was trying to be dominant or anything, but the action was meaningful in a sense that I felt a certain way about it. And I imagine a lot of people are like that. A lot of people probably don't like it when somebody puts their hands on their shoulder for a long period of time. Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor, so while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one -on -one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. Welcome to the Bravery Academy. My name is Emma Ferris and I'm your host. This podcast is crafted to share the stories of courageous individuals who have overcome adversity and found the courage to live their best lives. We'll explore the science of well-being, courage and connection and interview top thought leaders, game changers and survivors. It is from these stories that we learn what resilience is, how to heal, how to recover and how to be brave. Now, how about the idea of the rate of speech? 
that the rate of speech can be used to tell us something about what somebody's thinking. Well, we see here that the average rate of talking is around 125 to 225 words per minute. And at the upper end of that range, people start to resist the speaker. So if somebody's talking close to 225, people kind of pull back. They don't feel engaged anymore, and they maybe are feeling pressured by that pressured speech. It's a little bit pressured at that speed. So there is something meaningful about the rate of speech. It tells us something. Now, what's interesting here, though, is when speech is slow, because somebody has a lot of pauses, this is thought to be an indicator of deception. So if somebody talks in that normal range, even toward the high end of that normal range, that's still not linked to deception. But the lower range, there's this idea that it is. Of course, we know this is also not true. Again, whenever you get into deception detection, a lot of these body language theories really fall apart. So the rate of speech really isn't tied to deception. But like I said, it does have some meaning. Another myth I've heard quite a bit is that the Superman or Wonder Woman pose changes hormone secretion. So this is standing with your feet apart and your hands on your hips. The idea here is that it increases testosterone secretion, which would make somebody more dominant, and decreases cortisol secretion, which would make somebody less stressed. Turns out it doesn't do either one of those things. So it may make you feel comfortable to stand that way. You may feel dominant or powerful or energized or confident or whatever, but it's not doing anything at a hormonal level. Another thing we hear about body language is this idea that hand gestures toward the lower part of the face, like stroking one's chin or propping your chin up with your hand or putting your finger on your cheek, indicate that you're thinking. And at thinking, if you're indicating you're thinking anyway, this is indicating that you're intellectual. So essentially, you can tell if somebody's intellectual by their movements of their hands around the lower part of their face. Research tells us that you can't, although I think some of these different gestures, people believe it communicates that they're intellectual. People do them with the idea that people will interpret them that way, but they don't have that meaning in reality. We know there's no connection there in terms of intellect and hand gestures. What about crossing of the arms? This is a big one I've heard a lot about. Interestingly, research supports the idea that if you cross your arms, you might be indicating resistance. The problem is it can also mean a lot of other things, and there's no way to know what it means without really talking to somebody and trying to figure it out. Somebody could be cold, insecure, concentrating, or that could just be their normal, comfortable position. So crossed arms in conjunction with some other things might tell you about resistance. Like if somebody says something that also indicates they're being resistant, you might be able to add the fact that their arms are crossed to that in terms of drawing some conclusions. But again, it's kind of iffy with this one. The next one I'll cover here is the blink rate. And I've read a lot about blink rates and staring and this whole phenomenon, really a lot about the eyes in general. I mentioned the eye contact part before. Research finds that the average blink rate for someone who's relaxed is about 10 to 20 blinks per minute. And in normal discussion, this increases to about 20 to 25 blinks per minute. Now, if somebody appears before like a camera of some type, then the blink rate can go much higher. It can go 30 to 50 times per minute and potentially even higher than that. Now, when a blink rate gets above 50, and especially when it gets to around 70, this does tend to indicate somebody is under a lot of stress. Now, the problem here is, though, how are you going to count that? I think generally you would need some sort of machine to count that. I don't think that most people could do that just by looking at somebody's eyes, although it might be possible. Certainly, you would have to be kind of intensely looking in order to do it either way. So it's important to remember here, though, as well, this isn't about lying. It's just about an increased stress level. So the last body gesture I'll cover here is when somebody puts their hands behind their back. This is thought of as being, again, kind of a power and dominance move. But we actually see that most people find this gesture untrustworthy because somebody's hiding their hands. And if a person can't see somebody's hands, they're going to be a little suspicious. So this one kind of makes sense. But again, some people are just more comfortable with their hands behind their back. But you may want to be aware that some people, again, find that a little bit unnerving. I don't think this is really a big deal. And again, like I mentioned before about a lot of these, it's not tied to deception or anything like that. So when we're looking at body language and we're thinking about like mental health counseling and other work that counselors do, 
it's important to know what normal is. If you are trying to interpret nonverbal communication, and I think it is valuable to try to interpret that to a degree, you have to know what the baseline is. You have to know what somebody's like before you start worrying about any type of analysis. It's also important to remember that one single gesture may not have any meaning. Usually when we think about body language and we start to put meaning behind it, it's when certain gestures cluster together along with verbal cues, what somebody's actually saying. So again, we're kind of taking evidence and putting it together and looking at a theme and not just looking at one bit of evidence and drawing a conclusion from that. So moving back to an earlier point about nonverbal behavior and deception, is there ever a time, is there any evidence that supports that watching somebody's nonverbal behavior could give you some indication that they are deceiving you? Well, there's actually some interesting research on this. We do see that if you train individuals in detecting nonverbal behavior, they become slightly better at detecting deception than they would be through chance alone. It's a small difference. And if you train them to combine verbal content as well, so they're looking at the content of what somebody's saying and the nonverbals, you get more accuracy. But interestingly, the most accuracy is provided when somebody focuses on the verbal content and ignores the nonverbal behavior. This actually yields the highest detection rates. So I guess what I'm really saying is that the mental health community and other communities that might use this type of information to detect deception are not good at detecting deception through nonverbal behavior. And they're not good to such an extent that they're better off just focusing on the verbal content. So with all this talk about the value of nonverbal communication and detecting when somebody's lying, really, you can just focus on the content and do much better. So the conclusion here would be that nonverbal behavior isn't meaningless, but it doesn't reliably indicate deception. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Ars Longa Media. The executive producer is Dr. Patrick Beeman. For more content, please visit our website at arslanga.media. To leave feedback or suggestions, send an email to info at arslanga.media. To find more content from Dr. Grande, including a link to his YouTube channel and his other Ars Longa podcasts, visit our website at arslanga.media. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only and should not be construed as medical or mental health advice. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis. Hi, I'm Matt Harris. Seton Tucker and I host the podcast Impact of Influence, which for two years covered in depth Alec Murdoch, who was eventually convicted in 2023 of murdering his wife Maggie and son Paul. That story continues to evolve, and we will cover that. Plus, we will tell you stories of other true crime events that have happened in the South. Please join us on Impact of Influence. And give us a follow on the Impact of Influence Facebook page.